interesting is not only he became functionally kind of immune to pain, but that gave him the resilience to keep going despite obstacles. And that, that's still a method that we use in various parts of society, right? To, to help people discover their full potential is take them to the edge. Take them to the edge of what they think they can deal with and cope with. Then you have to find within yourself as the leader, okay, what is that point where I, I step in, um, where I let them know that, okay, failure is possible. Okay, nothing is perfect. And, and we can, you know, but here's, here, maybe here's how we can help you get through this or how, help you um, get what you need to be successful in this particular task. And the, the, what the whole meaning behind it is, yeah, when you're, when you're comfortable, you can do whatever you want. But let's see what if you can still do that when you're very uncomfortable. So my passion is how does the how does the human psychophysical organism work? How how are we supposed how what is life supposed to be like? So looking at all those questions of mindset, peak performance, how do you get to peak performance? What is peak performance? Uh, how do we do things better and better? How do we do things in a way that accords with with who we really are? I think yeah I think at the same time you know when it comes to teams. A lot of people maybe place too much emphasis these days on, on team dynamics. So everybody's doing team building workshops and everyone's talking about personality profiles, whether it's Myers-Briggs or it's DISC or it's whatever it is. And all those things can be useful and they can be helpful. Um, but, and it's a very lucrative niche. That's the big danger, you know, especially for people over, you know, over 60 and you go down and as they say, if you're over 60 and you break your hip or you break your femur, your chances of surviving go go down by for a year, go down by about 30, 35 percent. Do you know why that happens? Is it like I don't understand why that happens. I, I'm, this is this is not a fun story, but it's a story. My aunt broke her hip and she's no longer with us. So. Why does breaking your hip reduce your life expectancy? Yeah, I think I, I, I could say I'm maybe not totally clear on that, too. But I think it has to do with the fact that when people lose their mobility, they end up staying immobile in bed, typically. And mm -hmm. then fluids build up in the lungs. And I think it, it's more than anything, it leads to pneumonia. Oh, that's as horrible. far as I know. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that actually happened. You know, yeah. it's quite interesting, though, because we speak about the complexities of the human body. Who knew breaking your hip, which is pretty much, you know, down, down there, not, not yeah. up here, but down there, affects the lung here. And because the lung yeah. here is affected, the brain gets affected because, you know, oxygen isn't being pumped there. And next thing you know, everything's gone bad and you're not, you're not here anymore. That's crazy. But yeah. the, reason why, the reason why I bring this up is it's a lot like leadership. You realize it though, right? Because when you're leading a team, so let's say it's a five person team and you and one member might have got off on the wrong foot one morning. And because of the dynamics, the relationships within that group, you could lose the whole group if you don't handle the situation properly. You might be the leader, but that doesn't mean you're the most influential figure. Huh? No, absolutely true. And if you're the leader, if you, you know, whether you're in a leadership position, and there's a difference, of course, between you know, an official leadership position and being a leader, because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes people who are not in official positions are very much leaders. Yes. But if you are that kind of person, if you have that kind of influence on, on the team, then you'd better be the first to apologize and make things right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the the guy with the stick whipping them into submission. That's never going to work. You look at um, kingdoms oh. and dynasties that were run on tyranny. They never yeah. last. No. There's a reason for that. I think, yeah, I think at the same time, you know, when it comes to teams, mm -hmm. a lot of people maybe place too much emphasis these days on, on team dynamics. So everybody's doing team building workshops and everyone's talking about personality profiles, whether it's Myers-Briggs or it's DISC or it's whatever it is. And mm -hmm. all those things can be useful and they can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it's a very lucrative niche, yes. but it's also an exaggerated one to, to a certain extent problems with teams mostly have to do, in my experience, with the teams not having a, a clear mission to which everybody buys in and everybody's passionate about and not having the authority to execute on that mission without endless interference. Mm -hmm. That's the big problem. 
And that's why people leave teams because they're not happy and they're not happy because they're not being challenged. They're not happy because not they fulfilled. don't have a sense of fulfillment. Yeah. Mm. So how can we then give them a sense of fulfillment and how can we challenge them without breaking them? Before you answer the um, backstory, we had, um, um, we had an entrepreneur and investor, um, Bernard Chung. He's a billionaire investor and entrepreneur, mind you. And he says that one of the things that he notices or that he does that helps him be successful in his business. And it's also something we discovered, me and him, while talking about the successful entrepreneurs of time past and so on, is that the successful businesses tend to focus a lot on the people. So he says that when he's starting a business, he gets the people right. And he then mentions that whenever the team from his business or someone is in need. I remember this guy's a billion, billionaire entrepreneur and investor. He, he's come around money before. He, when someone is in need, it says that he doesn't, unless they're like really, really in need, he doesn't give them money. And I didn't get to ask. He literally just went on and said that because when he gives them money, it's like he's in a way in his own, I don't remember exactly words he used, but it's like he was saying that when he gives them money, it's like he's robbing them of the opportunity to earn it. And by doing that, he's doing more harm than good. So what he does is he gives them advice. And I had to ask him, which is what I'm asking you right now, how do you know when too much of a challenge is being administered? How do you know when to help? Because, you know, everyone has a different threshold for how much pain they can tolerate and how much misfortune they can tolerate. So how do you know when to step in and help? And how do you know when to stand back and allow them to grind through the problems or the difficulties? And then this will also lead to fulfillment and be challenged. Yeah, so it sounds to me like what he was saying was he wanted to teach people to fish instead of just giving them a fish, to use the old <laughs> proverb, right? right? Yeah. It was exactly that. And it makes sense. Um, on a team, when it when it comes to a challenge, you know, it depends, too, whether the, the, the challenge is a challenge just for one person, which can be the case. Uh, you know, they have, let's say, their little bit to do in the overall picture, and they're not, they don't maybe have the capabilities to do it or is stretching their capabilities, stretching them out of their comfort zone, um, as opposed to, for instance, something that everybody is doing together. But if it's, you know, a person going out of their comfort zone, well, to a certain extent, if you're a good leader, you, you're going to allow that. Um, you're going to, because what you're trying to do is create an environment in which people can grow yeah. and face challenges. And the interesting thing is then you have to, find within yourself as the leader, okay, what is that point where I, I step in, um, where I let them know that, okay, failure is possible. Okay. Nothing is perfect. And, and we can, you know, but here's, here, maybe here's how we can help you get through this or how help you um, get what you need to be successful in this particular task. So mm -hmm. there's no quick and easy answer to that kind of dilemma. That really takes, you have to be the kind of leader who's able to observe and willing to observe and not just, you know, bark orders and say, I want this done. I want it done by date X. I want it here on my desk. It better be good. Well, yeah, okay. But, you know, bad stuff happens. But the other dynamic too is, you know, to, to use the, the story of the billionaire. Now, when the billionaire is talking about giving advice to people about how to earn more, earn more money, um, mm -hmm. that's his, that's his wheelhouse, right? That's his bailey. He's, he's very comfortable there. Any advice he gives is going to be well-founded. Yes. Presumably. Um, but on a team in a modern workplace, that isn't necessarily the case because often the person who's in charge knows less about the concrete tasks and has less expertise in the the area the team deals in or deals mm -hmm. with than the people yeah. on the team do. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's this old thing about the old uh, the old way that indus industries, companies, organizations were always structured and most still are. Uh, which is really what we call a hierarchical command and control model. Okay, so all orders flow down, yeah, and good good news flows up, and that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that's how that's how things were organized in the industrial age, and it was built on a valid premise, which was the people at the person at the higher level knows more, simply factually knows more, has more yeah. expertise than the person below them. And in so, the modern workplace, that's completely, completely yeah, that's the other way around. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, there, yeah, anyway, we could talk about where that was sort of first discovered and the incredible origins of sort of modern corporate culture. But <laughs> unfortunately, the old paradigm is still very much, it's, it's still very prevalent. 
there are a lot of things going through my mind right now. Because you, you know the interesting thing, and this is quite um, fascinating. You look at all the successful businesses across history and you look at the founders and the entrepreneurs that brought these businesses. One of the things that they really focused on was multiplying their, as a founder, um, efforts across the business scalably. And the way that they do that is not only through dynamic leadership, but by training and developing the talent to get the work done. All right. So I really do want yep. to touch on that. But here's the thing. We had a very soft um, beginning to the episode. Soft, not in the sense of oh, soft and terrible, but soft as in the sense that very lighthearted, nice conversation, the snow in Ottawa. And that's what we like to do it. Nice conversation. But I want to have the guests have a better understanding of who you are so that whenever you speak, the authority comes across and the credibility is there because they say, ah, yes, this is... Dr. Simeon, and he has been there. He has done that. Mind, mind you, my grandfather's name was Simeon, spelled differently, but, you know, still Simeon. So can you just tell us in a few words? Matter of fact, before we do that, where is your favorite city? Where is my favorite city? Or what is oh, yeah. it? Where? Where is your favorite city? Mm. That's a really tough question. I can tell you one thing. I can tell you that I was once in a particular city in Europe that I really want to go back to because I rem was only there for about a day and a half and I remember it being very beautiful and I want to explore it more. That city Prague. was uh, Stra Strasbourg. Ooh, Strasbourg. Yeah. You don't hear that very often. That's Austria, right? Uh, France. France, it's, Strasbourg. It, it's, oh, yes. yes, yeah, yes. It's, Fr France. it's France. It's, uh, yeah, south of France. Well, not not totally south. It's, it's in that area... Alsace-Lorraine that's gone back and forth between France and Germany interminably, but mm -hmm. since the Second World War, it has been in France. So it's a uh, that region, and it's where the European Parliament is actually in Strasbourg. Oh, oh. Yeah. the tradition we have on the show to introduce our guests is that we always ask this question. So let us assume that you and I are friends. You and I are friends having a wonderful afternoon in Strasbourg, France, walking down the road, and. One of my friends are approaching us. And I just said, you know what? Let me introduce you to my friend. So I say to my friend, friend, this is Dr. Simeon Roger. And I say to you, um, Simeon, this is friend. When I introduce friend to you, who exactly is friend meeting at this time? Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously me. Um, uh, <laughs> beyond that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> depends. Where, where do you want me to go from here? I mean, you know, anyone can sort of do a standard bio, I guess. Yeah, but that's the thing, though. You speak about yeah. the things that most interest you and the thing that you would like to have yeah. our audience know about you right off the bat. So maybe you're a fine chef. Who knows? You love fine dining and you do cook fine meals. So maybe you want to voice that. Maybe you want to talk about your professional career. Or maybe you just want to talk about a hobby. We don't know. It depends on you. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hobbies, yeah. Martial arts. I love martial arts. I've been in martial arts all my life, um, mm -hmm. focusing on right now on various types of various type, a couple different styles of, of Tai Chi and things like that, but also mm. done lots of other stuff. Judo, Shaolin, Wing Chun, uh, Ooh, Wing Chun. Aikido, uh, <laughs> Aikido, you know, Jiu -Jitsu? Yeah. so done a lot of, a lot of things like that. I've taught at university. Uh, mm. I've, I don't know, I speak a bunch of languages, uh, work professionally in eight foreign languages, Seven, seven or eight. Oh, I can't remember. That's nice. um, and and I was I worked as a priest of the Eastern Orthodox Church for twenty uh, twenty ish years, twenty plus. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I my 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 passion actually is is what I call human resilience. So my passion is how does the how does the human psychophysical organism work? How how are we supposed how what is life supposed to be like? So looking at all those questions of mindset, peak performance, how do you get to peak performance? What is peak performance? Uh, how do we do things better and better? How do we do things in a way that accords with with who we really are? And in, you know when we look at organizations and we see organizations with problems, well, I'm sorry, but it's every time it's because what you're doing, the way you're handling things, violates the fundamental principles of the way the human being is built. Okay, so that's the origin of your problems, yeah. right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're if you have a team that's coming apart at the seams, more than mm -hmm. likely you've put them inside a system, a bureaucratic system or an organizational system that is dysfunctional. 
and mm -hmm. you're not you don't see the dysfunction in fact they probably don't see the dysfunction because they're in it mm -hmm. but most human organizational systems are and i just did a video about this this week hideously dysfunctional uh. <laughs> right but the people who wow. don't see it the people who honestly jabez the people who don't see it are the people who are in it yes even if they're suffering they don't necessarily understand the causes of what's going on and therefore how to fix it and very often they take it as well they just you know if they've only ever been in one type of organizational culture they have no idea that there is even an alternative and that becomes the big problem right yeah I so that's that. my, my focus has been this human resilience but it does transfer over to organizations and how they function and having been in so many dysfunctional organizational settings mm -hmm. uh yeah <laughs> You... I started collecting stories to over 20 years ago about how, you know, what not to do. Uh... And uh, so we kind of, uh, for purposes of the, the book I wrote about it, I created this fictional company where I could download, to which I could attribute all of these stupid things that they were doing. And the mm -hmm. fictional company, I simply called it Not Rocket Science. Uh... So not as in K-N-O-T, the name, Not Rocket mm -hmm. Science. And, mm -hmm. you know, because... None of this is terribly complicated, but it gets complicated because our culture tells us to organize things one way because we're very linear in our thinking, uh -huh. right? Our civilization is very linear, mm -hmm. but many things that go into an organization and organizational success, and I'm sure you're, the billionaire you interviewed would tell you this, mm -hmm. are not linear. Yes, that's true. Right? They're not linear processes. They're not, you can't program them. You can't control them. There's a certain amount of inherent chaos. But bureaucrats don't like chaos. Please, go yeah, ahead. It, this allergy to chaos gets us into into trouble. It really does. <laughs> but um, I hear so many things that I want to touch on. But I'm going to take them step by step and then see sure. how far I it. can get. You normally, whenever you meet someone, you can sum up their life in a few experiences. You've had so many experiences, like you've lived seven lives already. Are you a cat? You have two more to live or something? Well, that's brilliant. Hopefully, um, at least two. At least two. There's a quote by Bruce Lee, I believe. It's It says that it is better to be a warrior in a garden than be a gardener in a war. And I think you summed this up perfectly because you were not only a priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but you've also studied, practiced martial arts for quite some time as well and in various forms. Wing Chun being one of them. I like Wing Chun. The reason why I bring this up is because in your forays, into human resilience, religion, faith, in, over, in, in, in essence, and martial arts must have taught you so much. And the thing that I like about your approach, or well, it's your story today, because I can't say that at the onset you decide that this is the way you would go. Human resilience, the dysfunctions of companies and teams, not rocket science, and everything that you've taught us, I believe your experiences have primed you to not only write your book, but to study this field. Because on the one hand, faith teaches us about resilience and the human ability to overcome suffering and the cross, as we would put it, or the potential within, because not every, not every human is going to overcome. But the other side of it is martial arts, training and mastering the physical body, not to destroy, but to withhold yourself from destroying others, but being capable of such destruction at any time. And... I combine those into the idea behind not rocket science, all the stupid things that companies do following. And as you say, this is stemmed from following the, I wouldn't say just the general knowledge that has been disseminated, but general and presumed assumptions, because a lot of these aren't true, but we assume them to be true and accept them as such. What I'm trying to get at is what has been your experience in this study like, You've seen so many things from so many different perspectives. What has been your experience, in just a nutshell, of a general understanding of human resilience and the human potential to overcome obstacles and achieve great things? See if I understand the question. So you're... Let me ask again. Yeah, okay, trying. that'd be good. Yeah, so given all these experiences... What would you say has been your personal experience, whether in your personal life or in interacting with others, in the potential for humans to be resilient and to achieve great things? Okay. <clears throat> it's mainly philosophical, this question. 
It it is, and it's hard. To, I'm trying to get a grip on the question so I can really understand where to go with it, and I'm not sure I'm succeeding. But um, give an example. Yeah, sure. All right. So I love anime and manga. The reason why I love anime and manga is because in these um, art forms, as you would put it, there are different stories that are told that teaches us a valuable lesson. And there are so many stories. One of the stories that I like the most is um, Kingdom. And Kingdom retells the story of how China got unified into one country as it is today. And the king, um, King Ying Zhen or Heisei, he was a king that was born of a harlot to the king of another country. But the country in which he was born is enemy, enemy state. His dad left him there with his mother, who is a harlot at this stage. And because of that, he was pretty much, lay, pretty much persecuted, barbarically, mind you, beaten, his arm broken. He got so damaged psychologically that he took a stick and impaled it into his hand. And he showed someone that was trying to show him love. And he said to her that, you see, I don't even feel pain anymore. The blood is streaming down his hand and said, I don't, I don't feel pain anymore. That, that shows just how badly I'd been hurt. And it would turn out that he became king of the country after his dad died. So he left that enemy state, went home, became king. And he was the one that unified China. The reason why he unified China is because he said that he wants to bring an end to the war in states. So countries would war and the loser would lose their country and their people and everything. And the winner mm-hmm. would triumph. But that was just all the bloodshed. And a lot of times you would think that in cartoons or in shows or in movies or whatever, it would be a, a childish dream such that, okay, let me go and talk to this leader. Let's have peace. Go talk to this leader. Let's have peace. Instead, he pursued this dream with the blood and sword, with blood and the sword. And the reason is because he knew that it would not come to an end just by talking alone, but he did it with good intentions. The reason why I bring this up is such a dynamic story to break down from a psychological or philosophical perspective. But within him, he could have sworn death on everyone in that country that treated him so poorly. He, from his own experiences, could have decided that he was going to be the worst person possible. We think of like Sol Solzhenitsyn, for example, the Gulag Archipelago. But mm-hmm. instead, he chose that because of this experience that I suffered, which really was because of the war in states, hence he was in enemy state. If it is such that everyone is from the same country, no one is from Chin, no one is from Wei, no one is from Zhao, which are different countries. If everyone is from one country, China, then there is no reason to discriminate against someone else because we're all Chinese. We all love our country, all striving together. So let's build one country so others don't have to suffer. That in and of itself, it's like that's potential that has been realized, mind you. But it's also in a simple sense showing how resilient humans can be from desire and temptation to do evil and instead choosing to do good, even though the methods, mind you, in this case, wasn't necessarily the most humane. Because he did choose war. Yeah, yeah, that's an amazing story. And it, uh, it makes me, it reminds me of, uh, you know, some things that are related to the Warring States period, mm-hmm. and, but also to modern philosophy and modern martial arts and 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 peak performance all of these things tie together because you know it's what's interesting is not only he became functionally kind of immune to pain Mm -hmm. but that gave him the resilience to keep going despite obstacles and that that's still a method that we use in various parts of society right to to help people discover their full potential is take Mm -hmm. them to the edge take them to the edge of what they think they can deal with and cope with i mean this is how special forces people are trained right you take them to the edge and can you keep going? Um, you know, everybody who goes into the Navy SEALs Hell Week is in excellent shape or they wouldn't be there. But only, yes. let's say, whatever 50% or whatever get through it, or maybe it's less or more, I don't know, don't remember. But the ones who get through don't get through on the basis of being physically fitter. Mm-hmm. They get through on the basis of having a mind that won't quit. Or well, it's the mental aspect. It's entirely mental. Mm-hmm. There's a hilarious story from a different special forces unit, the British SAS, where mm-hmm. so they're, the guys are coming in for their, their equivalent of Navy Hell Week. And so this and they're registering all these people at a desk and at the desk is sitting this British sergeant major. And and this one guy comes up to register and he starts bragging about how fit he is and how he's going to he's going to just ace this. It's going to be no problem. It's going to be a pushover. Uh, and, you know, he says, I can run. I don't know. I can run 50 miles. And the sergeant major calmly looks at him and says, good, 
we'll see if you can do that when your socks are wet. Mm. That's all he says. Mm-hmm. And the, the, but the whole meaning behind it is, yeah, when you're, when you're comfortable, you can do whatever you want. But let's see what if you can still do that when you're very uncomfortable. And almost nothing is as uncomfortable as having wet socks that then slide down your foot and get under your foot and expose mm-hmm. your ankles to your boots. Mm-hmm. So they start chafing. Yes. And and the reason and that's the reason why in, in SAS selection, what they do for people is they they yeah, they have them go on a, I don't know, X mile run through the Brecon Beacon. And then at the closer to the end of the selection process, they take them on a run that's almost identical in route, except they have to go through a stream that's about this deep. Ooh. So their entire body is going to be wet. And then they still have to go on the next, I don't know, 30 miles or whatever. Mm. So, which makes it hell, right? Mm. So the ones who got through the first time are the one, you know, that's great. You know, let's say you have 70 people get through the first time. You might only have half that many get through the second time. Oh. And a lot of the time, the people who had the best times on that first run, they mm-hmm. don't survive the second one. Wow. So it is, there is this aspect of going to, until you take yourself to the edge or until you're taken to the edge, you don't know what you've got in you. And the most effective and efficient way to do that is to take people to the edge physically, mm. right? And that's where once they're at the what they think is the ed, the edge of their abilities physically, that's where the inner resources kick in. That's a real and start. And that's where you find out what you've got. Mm-hmm. I love your story. And you know what it also um, points back to? It points back to at the start of the episode, and we were discussing what the billionaire said in that unless it's absolutely necessary, he doesn't like to give help because then he's hurting them instead of yeah. helping them. So what would you say are some of the so there's a book the five dysfunctions of a team i believe it is so what would you say are some of the glaring errors and misassumptions that we have that has called that have caused us more harm than good in our workplace and in our teams these days wow okay glaring assumptions um well one we've already touched on i think and that is the this you know the just that we are as a culture we're so mental we're very cerebral as a Western culture. And because of that, we like, we tend to like what is orderly, what makes sense, what's logical. And, but as we said, there's nothing logical about what goes on in and what has to go on in a successful organization. Look at innovation, right? Innovation by its nature is not linear. You can't, you can't control innovation. Mm -hmm. You can try and people do people set up. Okay. You're the innovation team. Go off and innovate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Sure. Good luck. But it's not a linear process mm-hmm. because as we know, innovation depends on creativity and creativity is not linear. Exactly. So we know from the way the human being functions that we be, mm-hmm. when we put ourselves into what the brain, what in neurology we call creative mode, the creative mode of the brain, which has its own neurological and neurochemical markers, when we be when we're doing and we automatically kick ourselves into that state when we are being creative so when we're doing something that you'd love to do it might be you know maybe we're playing piano maybe we're fixing something maybe it's woodworking maybe we're planning a surprise party for somebody it doesn't matter all of those things are very creative so when we're being creative we feel really good emotionally we're just very relaxed we're really enjoying ourselves and but the creative mode has a tendency to shut down the monkey mind Right. Mm-hmm. So the, the busyness, the emotionalized, rational mind gets shut down to a considerable extent when we're being creative. We can get very focused. <clears throat> and that's part of the reason we feel good. But because this rational mind is shut down, our intuition mm-hmm. is much more available. Oh. And that's why so many uh, even technological breakthroughs have happened when a person has been when the rational when a person has been in a state where the rational mind is pretty much disabled or out of commission. Mm -hmm. So, for example, so many breakthroughs happen or insights come to people when they're either just waking up or just falling asleep or they wake up in the middle of the night or they're sitting on the toilet or they're taking a shower. All of these things where there's, you know, not much going on here. Mm -hmm. And this is where some of these great breakthroughs happen or where solutions to a puzzle happen. I remember when I was a kid, I was doing a project on, of all things, World War I. And I remember reading about 
how they figured out a, a breakthrough in air combat. And the breakthrough in air combat was, remember, like those rickety old biplanes that look like they're held together by duct tape. Um, mm -hmm. So the problem was they wanted machine guns so they could shoot down other planes. Okay. But the big problem was to aim the machine gun properly, you really need it in front of the pilot. The problem, of course, there was the propeller. Yes. So the big danger, obviously, well, you can't put the machine guns there. You'll, you'll shoot your propeller shoot off. Shoot and, you'll, and we haven't uh, developed a parachute yet, so this will not go well. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, but the guy, the guy who figured out how to synchronize the machine gun and the propeller so that the, blade, the bullet would never hit the blade as the blade rotated, the insight came when, I don't know, the, again, the person was, I can't remember, precisely on the toilet, in the shower, just like zoned out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is the nature of innovation, that it, it, it is not predictable. And not only is it not predictable, right? But the other problem mm -hmm. is, oh, yeah, we can, we can say, oh, yeah, we want to innovate. We want to innovate. We love innovation. Mm -hmm. That's really easy to say until you realize that innovation is inherently disruptive. Yes. It creates chaos. So, because that's what it does. It yeah. changes the way of thinking and approach. Yeah. It may change your entire production line if you're, you know, in a technological business. Mm -hmm. It may change your business processes. It may change any number of other things. It, it, it demands mm -hmm. something of you. And if you're in a very linear mindset, as most bureaucracies are, you don't like that. Mm -hmm. you're, you're constantly looking for the perfect, the perfect system where everything's yes. in control, everything is, is in its place. Well, that... Even if you succeed at finding that, and I and I, you know, I hope for your sake you never do, uh, yeah. it's going to kill you <laughs> because yeah. there's there's no growth there. Growth is disruptive. Um, I want to clarify. I just want to ensure that this is what you're saying. You're saying that whenever you're highly focused and you have a breakthrough, it normally happens on a backdrop of when you're highly focused, your emotions decline, and you have a heightened sense of. Where is, where is that exactly the, that the activity increases that leads to the breakthrough? I don't think it's, I don't think it, yeah, it, it typically happens. The easiest way for a human being to get into this state is just to be creative, is to do something you love to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, simply because create be, being creative is a nonlinear process, right? It's not, it's not log, it's not a logical process. Yes. It's a difference between say you're trying to write an article. Okay. And mm -hmm. you have two ways of going about it. One is, Okay, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write that article. Okay, okay. and you're going and guaranteed if you try to do that, you're going to sit down and you're going to have to say, okay, here I go, and you're going to have to force yourself, and it's going to be an extremely rational, mind-driven process at that point, mm -hmm. right? Because you're forcing it, yes. as opposed to if you're just, you know, I don't know, sitting on a beach with your pina colada. And just uh, vaguely thinking about it, all kinds of ideas are going to come to you. Mm -hmm. You're not because you're not trying to force it, and you practically the whole thing comes up in your mind, and you see it as sort of a tapestry. Mm -hmm. But then you have to capture it on paper. But it becomes much easier because you've allowed this process to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've allowed so much to uh, to come to you. Now, where does that information come from? That's a whole other debate. But the the point is, it has. You, it's almost as if you have downloaded information or allowed it to bubble up or whatever it is, instead of sitting down and trying to force it. And everybody knows from experience, or many, many people do, and you, if you try to force it, the result is never as good. True. And it also doesn't feel good because it's no longer a creative process. It's a, a process of just force. Does that explain why whenever I get highly focused on work, like I'm doing... 15, 16 hour days consistently just ironing out a task. Like I'm trying to figure out how to get a certain business started or how to solve a major business problem. And I'm working at it consistently for days. I get to a point where my emotions decline to a point where it's like I'm almost cold. So it's like, I could be telling you that, all right, it's time to have dinner. But the way I say it, it sounds like I'm angry with you and I'm really not. But my emotions have just declined to such a point where I'm like, point in case, I was home the other day. I was working really hard for like a week and a half, perhaps two weeks at this point. And there was an accident. A tree branch fell on the electrical lines, right? The power lines. The light yeah. went out and back and out and back. And that could cause a fire as well because the branch was still sitting on the power line. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the problem, came back went to two people I was living with and I just said to them, 
you do this, you do this. And I left. And they were so upset because they felt like I was being rude and disrespectful. In my mind, I saw a problem that needed to be solved. And I was like, you know what? Delegate this and move on. You do this, you do this, and that's going to solve the problem. And I left and went back to work. So does that explain it? It sounds like, would you, how, I'm wondering if you would put it this way. Did you feel that when you were so highly focused that you were almost, to use a, a very cliche type of expression, you were in the zone? For days. Right. I was just getting stuff done and figuring stuff out I never knew I could do. Yeah. And when you were in that state, I'm betting you were kind of oblivious to most other considerations, right? There wasn't a lot in it or sleeping. That's the thing. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. <clears throat> yeah. Th- and that, that's, that is really interesting. And especially the fact that, yeah, you just became very businesslike, very sort of matter of fact. And it wasn't mm-hmm. that you were trying to be rude or, you know, that you lost human empathy. It was just, you were just very focused and focused. direct. Yeah. And at that point, what was happening was a problem. And in business, problems come, find a solution. Either you fix it or you delegate the solution to someone else. So that's what I did. It was just like, all right, you do this, you do this, and it'll be all right. And I left, and they were not happy. So <laughs> it led to a fight. I wasn't happy about it either because I'm like, all right. But I digress. You know, the thing that's quite interesting about this, although you've spoken about the brain in such fluid terms. You've not used any complex jargon like um, prefrontal cortex or anything like that. And you've beautifully explained just where creativity comes from. Now, I'm going to assume, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, as I'm the student to your teacher at this moment, I'm going to assume quite humbly that creativity is also a large part of bringing out peak performance in teams, companies, and in people, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's, it's, a great part of, it's a big part of that because it's, it's a big part of what it means to be human. Mm-hmm. Okay, because as I said, when we're when we're being creative, we feel really good, and when we're not being creative, we don't feel so good. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing about forcing people to do work that's just you know that doesn't engage them, that isn't creative, that's just repetitive. That they you know so they're 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 not they're not feeling good. And a lot yes. of the time in our culture, because our culture is so go go go, it's so yes. Newtonian, it's so so linear okay you've got to do this you've got to get this done get this done get this done force push Mm -hmm. let's go let's control things let's you know so it drives people into a a more of a fight or flight kind of survival mode instead of allowing them to get into creative mode and this is what really cuts people off from who they are Uh, and you can't expect things to work properly in that kind of situation Mm-hmm. Now, the flip side of that is what what's creative for me might not be for you. For instance, uh-huh. uh, sure. I hate everything to do with administration. Hate it. <laughs> okay. So my accountant loves that stuff, lives for that stuff, oh, yes. right? Oh, yeah. And and that's the wonderful thing about society. We have people who love to do what you hate to do. Yeah. So you delegate. Right? Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. That's where you delegate, outsource, whatever. And mm-hmm. uh, so it, it is subjective to a degree, mm-hmm. right? So for some people, yes. like I'm sure for somebody like Michael Jordan, for example, playing I basketball was his creative outlet. Yes. You know, he, he lived for it. He did it amazingly well. Mm-hmm. And so there are all kinds of creative outlets. I mean, Bruce Lee, I mean, you brought up Bruce Lee. Look, I mean, he, he's very clear in his writings that martial arts was his creative outlet. It was a form mm-hmm. of expression for him. It wasn't just about beating people up or or learning stuff. It was just it was an expression of who he was, a creative outlet. I have my thinking cap on. Let me tell you what I'm thinking about. You speak about sure. the creative outlet and you speak about peak performance. And you even mentioned that in our society it's kind of Newtonian. Like keep going, remain in motion, do 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 do. Get this done yeah. by this time. And these are the processes. It's not. It's more science than art at this stage. If you want to write a creative blog post and convert the website visitors to customers, get the heading right, get the summary right, get the introductory right. This is a template to do this. Do, 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 do. It's not so much about sitting back on the beach with the pina colada anymore and allowing it to come to you, which, as you've rightly said, results in um, substandard results. But here's where my mind is. 
the word creativity came to mind in context of creative outlet. And creativity just literally means to create something. And I was thinking while you spoke about my creative outlet, my creative outlet is building things. I'm very much, um, I believe that's the left brain, I believe, very much analytical in my approach. I can be right brain. I can be artistic and everything. Don't like it very much. And the reason why I bring this up, could we then just form a connection, if it's not already formed, between the great creators of our time and time past and how they approached creativity to ultimately achieve peak performance? Because remember, like you said, creativity in and of itself, it's scary. It's, um, it's disruptive. So we can look at even Zuckerberg and Bezos today, Elon Musk. They've changed the way we socialize, we do commerce, and we travel. And that took a lot of creativity. So could we then suggest, postulate, even confirm that creativity creating and it's um, it being a, an outlet is very much related to and directly related to, mind you, to not only changing how we live, but I don't know, I guess I'm lost in my thought now. Hmm. But you said something really interesting there was, so building is your outlet, but you're very linear about it? No, no, no. So I'm saying no. that, no, I'm saying that today we're a Newtonian in how we are creative. Yeah. So if you want to write a creative article, they have templates and outlines and guides, and it's more science than yeah. art. But being creative is supposed to be scary. It's supposed to be challenging what's already there and finding a new way to do it that's much better. So could we suggest that the leaders of time past, the innovators, the creators that have changed the way we think, they were very creative people. But at the same time, what we're doing is we're destroying the potential for more creation just by being so archaic about how we approach it step by step scientifically. Well, I, I think we've been, <laughs> we, we have definitely been doing that. Um, we've been sabotaging ourselves as, a, as an entire culture. But, you know, that, that what you were saying there about, you know, even converting people on a web, on, on, in a sales process, right? The, the, the whole thing about, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, then client, then prospects become customers and blah, blah, blah. But if you look at sales, what converts mm -hmm. people, what trust. gets people engaged, trust by, and trust is built by, not by communicating facts, but by relating emotions. Yeah, exactly. Is you know, they say facts, tell stories, sell, and it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. So we, and that's that creative part. You get people engaged emotionally. Uh, mm -hmm. and if you were cynical, you would say it's social engineering, which uh, it is. And, and it's, there's a word for it in social engineering. Uh, they call it amygdala hijacking, um, hijacking oh. the primitive part of the brain, the emotional brain. part of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, tell people a story that engages them emotionally. Because, of course, when people are engaged emotionally, and this is actually why we like entertainment, because mm -hmm. it shuts down our rational mind and pulls us into something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so even if we're reading a book, we're seeing pictures in our yes. mind. Yes. And so it takes us into that emotional state, and that it's, it's pleasurable to us, but it also leaves us more open to influence. That's the other, the other half of it. But the creative process itself, I mean, on the one hand, if you look at, because, and, and I'm building here on the fact that you said you, you, you build things and that it, you, you, you see your process as linear to an extent, and it is. You know, if you're building a bridge, think, look at it, think of it this way. Like whoever came up with the Golden Gate Bridge in France, San Francisco, just to take a bridge, it's iconic, right? They had to, they had to see the possibilities be enthused, enthused about the possibilities. What will this do? And they had somehow to visualize this bridge. Okay, what, what would it take to build something that's that long, that's that strong over such a chasm? So they had to visualize it. But after they, you know, a certain amount of sort of seeing what it would be, mm -hmm. there, then there's some concrete technical problem solving. And you get yes. down, you have to get down to the math. <laughs> I mean, that's just it. Pretty much. And yeah. that's the core of it. But you know the thing that's really speaking to me as you see all of this? Isn't it then a delicate balance of creativity, as in the art of creativity, just visualizing what a solution could be in a new sense, but then following a technical approach? That's where the engineering, the physics, the science, the development and construction yeah. and all that. Then taking a, set, a, a scientific approach to problem solving and actually implementing the art, could that then be also considered a part of the creative process or are they yeah. one in the same of a bigger process? 
I think maybe they're two sides of the same coin. You don't, because you know, it's it's not that not that linear thinking is bad. It's that we've exaggerated it, and oh. by exaggerating it, we not only sabotage our own lives, but we sabotage our collective ability to solve problems and things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's not that it's a it's a bad thing. It's it can become part of that overall creative process itself. I think you're right. Um, you know, you don't want to. This is part of our problem in, in in society. We tend to go off. You know, we go off in one direction. We we turn something into an absolute, and we neglect to realize that well, everything about human life and everything about this universe that we live in is inherently complex, and it's always balance. Yes, it's um, it's a. Uh... It's a simple system of complexities for most things. But yep. following on everything that you've taught us so far, and I know you're into entrepreneurship and business. You've spoken with leaders and you've worked alongside them and so on. And I think the thing that's also going to be helpful here is your ability to understand team dynamics. How then can we build not just creative teams, but a creative culture that fosters creativity. I don't want to assume it's an easy task just by going against common knowledge and the practice of, you know, the Newtonian approach. Because all right, let me let me let me give you an example. Google instituted a policy where you work on Google and Google products and services for a set time, but you're you're paid for that time, but that's only eighty percent of your salary or thereabout. The other twenty percent mm-hmm. of your salary is for your own projects that you're interested in. And that's how we got Gmail. That's how we got um, Google Maps. Yeah. That's how we got Hangouts and so on. So, And I believe that's a creative effort because then now you're not working 40 hours. You're working 32 or 30. You're given 10 hours to sit and relax and ponder the things that are on your mind and how you would solve those problems. And then Google steps in and funds your project and however they work out the dynamics of that. How then can we create companies and cultures that are more like this then that's a really good illustration so it's it's really like taking 20 percent of your time and they're essentially what they're saying to you is okay we're in charge here in google okay we're the bosses but you work here so what Mm -hmm. else could we do right what what how would you where would you take this what what do you think we should be doing oh yeah and that's where you get these really cool ideas uh, instead of, you know, the old approach, which was always top down, here is the way we're going, get with the program. No, I don't mm-hmm. want your input. Just shut up and turn the widget. Yeah. Right. And that, that essentially is what, unfortunately, we're still saying, most organizations are still saying to people, I was at a, a conference um, quite a few years back here, here in Ottawa, and there were a whole bunch of people in, in the room, there were government people, private industry. And it was, it was a, talking about at that point, organizational culture. And one person stood up and said, our problem is we don't hire the best people. Mm. Somebody else immediately stood up and said, no, I totally disagree. We do hire the best people. The problem is we take those incredibly talented people and then we try to put them in a box and Mm. say, here's what you will do. And outside of the box, you will not do any of that. Mm. In other words, the thinking is still, we want you to come in and turn and turn our widget for us. Okay, we want we want you to tighten the widget, even though the widget now is electronic, and even though, you know, to turn this widget, you need a PhD. Uh, nevertheless, that's really what, we, what we're doing. And, but that's the, that's the problem, right? We're taking knowledge workers, people with huge potential, and sometimes people who are, you know, among the very top people anywhere doing particular, at particular things, and we're telling them we don't care what they think. Um, and whenever they do try to innovate, they get shut down. Yes. So, and then they get frustrated and leave. Now, that's yeah. become a real problem, right? Because, it, mm-hmm. you know, if you go back 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, companies didn't really necessarily care. Okay, you want to leave? That's fine. We can replace you. Um, even if that was not really true. You can't, replacing a body is easy. Replacing talent is different. But they could think to themselves, okay, I can replace anybody because we have more people applying than we have positions. And now that is completely flipped. Because now there are, training. yeah, now there's more work than there are people wanting it. Yes. And that dynamic is not going to change. I mean, there are, so. it, it differs from industry to industry. But I mean, I'm sorry, but the industrialized world's population is going down. Yeah. Um, and that's, a, that's what industrialization does. Mm-hmm. 
it drives your population uh, st- statistics down so that you're no longer having the necessary 2.1 children per female. And then your mm-hmm. population declines. Which is what we're on the brink of. Sorry for cutting you off. We're on the yeah, brink of that. You're right. Uh, you're familiar with Dr. Jordan Peterson, right? Yeah. He says that for the of first... Of course, he's Canadian. <laughs> yes, he is, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Great man. Great man, Stinka like, huh? Two great gentlemen right here. He says that for the first time in history, um, more than 50, it's actually 50.1% at the time, about two years ago, more than 50% of the female population at 30 are childless. And that's a problem because if they're not having kids, what on earth are we going to do in the future? You're familiar with um, Keynesian in economic terms? Robert Keynes, I believe it is? Yeah, Keynesian economics, yeah. Yes, and it's... For our listeners and viewers, essentially what Keynes said is that it's a Keynesian, um, Keynesian cross. It basically says that, no, it's not Keynesian I want to bring up. I want to bring up Malthus, Malthusian theory, where it said okay. that as population grew, we're going to go on the brink of destruction because food shortages and famine. But what he didn't take into consideration, which is where um, Keynes comes in, is that Keynes says that, no, 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 no. As the population grows, we're going to have more geniuses appear that are going to solve this problem, which directly ties back into the idea here of creativity. So it's all a really nice discussion we're having here. So given that we've gone this way, I want to bring up one other great man. I just want you to comment on his approach to creating um, a creative workplace. It's not his focus, but that's also a side effect, mind you, of his approach. Uh, Simon Sinek, you're familiar with him? Yeah. And start with oh, yeah. Why. What... Um, Simon postulates is that instead of going from the approach of what we're doing, how we're going to do it and why, what you want to do is you want to say why you're doing, how you're doing it, and then exactly what. And that's the approach that Apple has done. And the funny thing, it's not even funny. It's literally how the brain works. I've had a talk with Dr. John James Santangelo, and he wrote, he wrote a book on how the mind works and how you can hack your mind to become successful. He says that and quite effectively, quite true actually, is that if you sit down, and Dr. Peterson mentions the same thing in another term, if you sit down and you ask yourself truthfully, what do I want? Then it gives you an answer. And I'm sure you have a military training. When a general is sending out his team, if he tells them what to do, the mission has a higher chance of failure. If he also adds in why they do what they are going to do, so we need to take this hill because it's going to be a strategic point for the mission going forward in one, two, three ways. The mission has a higher chance of success because you can never predict what's going to happen. Instead, what you can do is you can tell what the outcome needs to be, why this outcome is important, and then the field leader can then decide in order to achieve this result, this is the best way to go given the changes that we've experienced. Why do I ramble like this? Because... In leadership and in business, it makes no sense to hire the best person, the best candidate. That is going to be smarter than you. That's why we say the top-down leadership structure doesn't work. The person yeah. doing the job has more hands-on experience than the leader anyway. It makes no sense to hire these people and tell them what they need to do and how they need to do it. And never tell them why. Tell them why you're doing what you're doing. Get out of the way and allow them to figure out the best way to get it done. And that's how you get Gmail and Google Maps and the like. <laughs> In other words, tell people exactly, yeah, tell people what needs to what what needs to happen, what the result needs to be and why, but don't tell them how to get there. Yes. And and that that's exactly right. And you know, one of the you, you talked about from the military angle, and a lot mm-hmm. of this thinking originated, uh, you may or may not know this, uh, from a, a very particular experience in the Second World War where this really came to the forefront. And it's in a way the origin of this type of thinking in corporate culture, mm-hmm. which is the experience of two different groups of people, The both of them in North Africa, in the British North African campaign. One mm-hmm. became the SAS, the Special Air Service, mm-hmm. and, which of course still exists. One became the Long Range Desert Group, which was dissolved at the end of the war. And both of these people, both both groups, led by two British officers, uh, Sterling and Bagnold, respectively, they they basically did the same thing. They went to the command of the British Eighth Army and said, I think I can help you. I think I can do something for you to cause irreparable damage to the Germans, mm-hmm. uh, to seriously improve your odds of beating Rommel's Africa Corps. 
And what they what they realized, of course, was that in Africa, they're fighting along this this fairly narrow band of the Sahara and that the entire southern flank was wide open yeah. and unguarded and because it was just desert. And so they were given both of these guys were given go aheads to form their units and conduct these raids on particular German targets. They targeted airfields, logistics, things that were critical to the enemy. <clears throat> and they did it just, you know, driving Jeeps, basically, is what it amounted to, Jeeps or small trucks. Uh, but to do this, to carry this out, they realized, both Sterling and Bagnall realized, I need the best people in the world. I actually need totally world-class people to be able to do this because we're going to be a small number of people. Our lives will depend on each other. So I need the best people in the world at communications, demolition, uh, transportation, and mechanics. Because if we get Recon. trapped in the Sahara, we're dead. <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. We need specialists in all of these things, and we need the very best. So they went out looking for who is the best. And they'd get names of people. And, they'd, and you know where they found a lot of these people? They were in the brig. They'd been thrown in, in, in jail by the British 8th Army because they were deemed insubordinate. They were deemed insubordinate because, frankly, they were smarter than everybody else and they knew it. And they were tired of this stupid British Army discipline because these were people who didn't need that kind of restrictive discipline, right? These were not people who were raw recruits off the street who had no military background or training. These were people who didn't need regulations, you know? And if we think of, you know, if we think of rules and regulations, uh, like a like speed limits on roads. It's nothing but it's nothing really more than a placeholder for good judgment. But these people already had good judgment. They didn't need all of this stuff and they didn't need the bureaucratic bullshit that came with it. So they ended up in the brig. And so Sterling and Bagnold had to get these people out of the brig so that they could participate and and you know do these cool missions that were so destructive to the Africa Corps. And they came up with a particular operating procedure which was when they were doing their planning for a mission, mm -hmm. they effectively took off their rank badges, said, I don't care what anybody's rank is here. Everybody's an expert. We all live or die together. So let's plan this. And to this day in, in special forces culture, that has continued, right? So it's, there's minimal, minimal care about who's, who, whose rank is what. Uh, and that's why special forces people have historically been despised by the regular army because they don't tend to salute and they tend to wear jeans and they tend to have beards and, you know, don't buy, you know, all of that insubordinate stuff. Right. Yeah. So it's that it's that getting down to what needs to be done. And it was this whole thing about, as you say, they're not being told how to do the mission. They're only being told what what needs to happen and why we need it to happen. That's it. And that's why they were so super motivated. And it's still, if you look at special forces people today, they use those same, that same motivation to get their people going because yeah, we're not being told how to do it, but we are being told what needs to happen. So how, how can we do this? Are you familiar with Ray Dalio and his book, um, Principles? Ray Dalio, I'm familiar with, haven't read the book. Oh, you want to read the book? Let me tell you what it's about and you can take a look at it. It's a principle that he uses in his company, Bridgewater. Bridgewater at the time was the largest private hedge fund in the world. And he predicted rather correctly and much to the disdain of the populous, popular um, thought and opinion at that time, the 07 housing crisis and recession that was going to occur. He was the one that said, this is going to happen if we continue. But of mm -hmm. course, it wasn't popular at the time. You had people like um, Berkshire Hathaway and um, Warren Buffett saying that, no, these bonds are secure. But that's another story. What principles outlines and how Ray Dalio runs Bridgewater is that it's a theory of, it's not a theory, it's a practice of radical transparency. So much like the special services that you just mentioned, I could be the senior manager and you could be the CFO, or let's say you're the CEO or the president. We're all in a meeting and we have a junior that's come in. We're all in a meeting. It is not your prerogative and your method of operation as the CEO or president or mine as a senior manager to tell this new recruit that his idea is no good because he is a new recruit. Matter of fact, what happens is that if this new recruit believes that he has an idea that can aid in our cause, he is allowed to voice that opinion and we are obligated to consider it 
under a practice of logical um, reasonings and questions and approach to figuring out, is he onto something? And quite yep. often than not, you're going to realize that he was onto something. And the reason why I believe this works is because now we, we don't have the top-down structure that we've been discussing. We don't have the top-down structure that we've been discussing, but we also give opportunity to everyone, the foot soldier, as you might put it, to say, based on my experience running up and down this terrain, we might be better off using horses than jeeps. Here's why. And now you're not stuck in the arcane way of doing things because of presumed assumptions, but you're doing exactly what needs to be done. So yeah, that, that's that's a book that I think you should definitely look at. And like I said, it's a it's the largest at the time private hedge fund in the world, mm-hmm. and that's not nothing, as Doctor Peterson no. would put it. <laughs> yeah, not nothing. Yep. This has been a wonderful talk. When we initially hopped on the call, I thought we would be discussing leadership and um, just peak performance because that's where most of your work is, but. I don't know. When we, when we edit the episode that we uploaded, we can figure out exactly where this conversation has been because we've gone through quite a lot, actually. Yeah, it's, it's gone into a lots of nooks and crannies, but I think all of them worthwhile. Yeah, and I think it all adds back to the bigger picture of just how our approach to not only creativity and leadership, but also execution and team building is dependent yeah. on so many different um, areas. No, absolutely. It's, we're, we're at... A, you know, I think you know you appreciate this very well, Jabez. That we're we're a culture that, in very many ways, we're um, we're heading into impasses of our own creation. Yes. And in those impasses, will we allow the? We we have a choice essentially. Mm-hmm. Are we going to allow? Will can we be creative enough to allow this the 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 solutions to come, or will yes. we continually try to force it? Will we continue, continually try to derail anything that? disturbs the status quo. And if we do the latter, of course, we end up where history so often takes human civilizations, Mm -hmm. crash and burn. Yes. You know, do we have to crash and burn before we move on to the next phase? Uh, Hopefully not. And that comes back to resiliency, the human resilient spirit, and also potential for achieving great things. I I remember the talk I had with Dr. John James Santangelo, and you're going to love this because this is what he works on. He says that 90% of the things that we do and our decisions and our perceptions are all subconscious. And our subconscious has been downloaded to us between the ages of zero to eight years old. It says some people say 10, he says eight years old, has been downloaded to our minds Mm -hmm. by our parents and those we look to for caregiving. So even if we were like, uh, uh, um, when you don't have parents, like a foster, like um, what do you call those people that don't have parents, please? Foster kids? Uh, foster. Foster yeah, foster kids. Yeah. Yes. So even so, if yeah, you're in a foster, foster home, yes. yeah. if you're in a foster home, your caregiver would be the leaders, the run the people who operate the foster care center. Those they are downloading their preconceived ideas and notions onto you. So until you get to the place yeah. where you can question everything around you, ninety percent of your outcomes are out of your control simply because of that. And, it's, and he was very clear about it. Whether or not the outcome is something that you like is irrelevant. It's just that you need to accept that you're the one influencing mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. Well, let me put it, let me let me add to that in one, one particular way. Mm-hmm. So that this Newtonian worldview that has had Western civilization in its grip for the last mm-hmm. 300 years, mm-hmm. um, not that the previous worldviews in the West were any, any help either, but this one, that forces us to be so linear, that puts us into sort of this sort of constant fight and flight, fight or flight mode, mentally, emotionally, mm-hmm. that this particular uh, worldview has been communicated to us so consistently since we were born that it's incredibly difficult for us to get out of it. Yes. I'll give you an example. So what we're really saying here is that every single human communication that you have had by the time you are eight years old and in fact, probably even up till now, just about. Yeah. Almost every, think about that, almost every single human communication has been communicating the Newtonian worldview to you. Yes. That's a lot of propaganda to get over. Yeah. And that's scary to approach because like yeah. Dr. Jordan Peterson would put it, what lies on the edge of the unknown is nothing but terror and absolute hell and dread because you don't know what's there. Yeah. We should have Dr. Peterson and yourself on one day. Oh, that'd be fun. He's a very interesting guy. I would love to have a panel discussion with yourself, Dr. Peterson, and um, Dr. John James Santangelo. Simon Sinek as well. 
<laughs> you know, you know what's interesting, and I find this quite fascinating. A lot of times, so you know, you know, you know about um, feedback and review systems, right? So if you go on a website and you see one bad review, generally that's indicative that there are nine good reviews. Because for every one bad review, there are nine. But it's just that when people are happy, they don't voice their concern as much. Yes, and also, true. It also ties back into the psychological phenomenon that people are more reactive, perceptive to pain than pleasure. You feel far worse losing $20 than you feel good gaining $20, right? The reason why I bring this up is because as I've talked to great men near and far, because I'm in Jamaica and I've talked to a few here, many from abroad, many like yourself and so on. One of the things that I've realized is that there's this, so it's like a two-part thing. So on the one hand, in the media, you watch the news, you go on social media, there's this absolute look of dread and fear. Like, oh, COVID, war, Israel, Hamas, whatever the case might be. There's always something yeah. to quake you out of your boots in fear. But mm -hmm. when you talk to the great men that are not only influencing, but dedicating their life to influence and change in a positive way, you see such potential for human greatness that you can't you can't cower in a corner and give up. It makes you want to get up, get out, and do something as well, however small it might be. You know, and I think if we can make this the mainstream media, not necessarily this <laughs> podcast, but talks like these, have people come in, sit down and discuss what the problems really are, what they've learned, and the potential solutions. If we can have this become the mainstream, just discussing problems and showing a step forward. It might not be the right step, but it's a step and a step in the right direction because at least you're trying to fix the problem. Maybe down the road, you'll figure out something that says, all right, this is why it didn't work. This will work. I think the world is such a better place. You know? Yeah. And I think we, we, you know, we do have often a bias that if you, especially if you watch the news too much, you'll think the world is going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> right. Every, you'll think everything's getting, getting worse and worse. Uh, and in fact, but what that, that's an interesting cognitive bias, though, isn't it? Because if you put yourself at any place in history, if, and if you know history, just put yourself in any place and time in the past, mm -hmm. and then you'll see, well, yeah, it was pretty much going to hell in a handbasket then, too, but maybe even worse. Yeah. And a friend of mine actually gave me, or put no, put me onto, I would say, this book, which you should read if you haven't. And that, so this yeah, is yeah. Steven Pinker. Mm -hmm. and called Enlightenment Now, the case for, well, he calls it the, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. But mm -hmm. what the book really is, is it's proving on the basis of objective data that, in fact, the world has been getting to be a better and better place, a safer yes. place, a more compassionate place continually for the last century and a half mm -hmm. or whatever, and that, in fact, everything is getting better. So we, you have to be careful about where you look for, you know, what your biases are yes, and where you look, where you get your information. And you also have to be careful of how you process the information. Glass yeah. half full, glass half empty, you know, and yep. your preconceived notions and your biases influence a lot how you approach things. So definitely look at things for the better as they are. <clears throat> this has been um, a wonderful talk. It's been excellent, very informative, very educational, lighthearted easy on it's the been ear. a lot of fun oh yes it has hasn't it yeah. is there anything that i perhaps should have touched on that you would have wanted me to touch on but i didn't really get around to not that comes to mind i think we've we've uh touched on just about it <laughs> well so many things and pretty much everything that's come up yeah um not only for now but in the past as well and not only here abroad as well so it's been good how did you enjoy your time on the podcast today I thought it was great to, to be honest. It, I mean, it just, it just flowed. It was just so organic. It was, you know, it wasn't a, uh, interrogation. It wasn't just, you know, here, answer these questions. It wasn't forced. It was just a conversation, as you say. And it was, uh, yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. Javis. I mean, I'll have to check into some of your other episodes even <laughs> more than I have, just because it's, you know, it's really, uh, you've got a great style going on. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's a lot better this way. Let's just have a conversation. because. Oh, yeah. it, you see, when you come with, um, yet again, pre-prepared questions, you yeah. could mention something that is so much better to discuss based on what we're experiencing and what we've talked about. But because I have 30 questions to go through, and then the final product becomes so disjointed and incoherent, and it's very hard to listen to. It doesn't flow, and 
I believe it's better this way. A question. I'll tell you, tell you a funny story. <laughs> so yeah. I had a, uh, a guy who, uh, well, I wrote a book, um, a personal development book years ago, it became an Amazon bestseller, but it was called the five pillars of life. And so when the, when the book came out or not too many years after, uh, there was a friend of mine in the U S uh, in, in personal development mm -hmm. who said, I'd like to interview you talk about your book. And I, it's, it's going to be for a small audience, like 25 people, mm -hmm. uh, cause it's, it was a mastermind group he had or something like that. And I said, sure. And it was, uh, close to Christmas. And he said, uh, I, I gave him some, you know, questions and a way to take the, take the dialogue. He completely threw that out, threw me totally off any preconceived game. Uh, and we just had a, an organic, I guess, conversation. And, uh, and later on he said, yeah, everything, everything works. Like if you, if you want to get the best out of someone, don't ever follow a preconceived program just go where you think it should go and the result of that strangely enough was that i sold 50 something like 50 copies of my book to 25 people so they got it for themselves and for a friend as well yeah yeah it was That's the only 200 percent conversion i've ever experienced in marketing and you see that comes will. To creativity because that was the personal touch all over again yeah the emotional connection thank you for sharing that story you know I'll tell you what, we have a tradition on the Boardroom Podcast where whenever a guest has come on, they've had a good time. We know the audience will have a good time. We like to ask, who is one? And you know, this is not even a really good car. I'll tell you, this is a Corolla or a Honda Civic. I kid you not. Or perhaps even a Nissan Sony. It's not a nice car. So why are they being so loud about it? Anyway, so we like to ask the guests, given your time on the podcast, who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, we will try to get them on. What is one question you would like to have us ask that guest for you as well? Okay. Do you know Constantine Kissin? No. Okay. Hope so Constantine is in the UK. Mm -hmm. He has a podcast called, it's some variation of the word trigonometry is the uh -huh. name of the podcast. It's, it might be a slight variation on that word. And he's a... He's a Russian speaker who was born in Ukraine, I believe, who moved to the UK. He speaks just perfect British English. You'd think he's totally British. Um, and he's a, he's sort of like Britain's answer to Jordan Peterson, you might say. Mm. Really bright guy. Uh, uh, what question to ask him? Mm. That's a good part. Uh, well, he's doing a lot of commentary on, on the culture wars at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, has a, certainly has a lot to say about... Israel and Hamas, but I mean, anything to do with where society is going uh, yes. is a place you could take it for him. Uh, yeah, he's he's someone, if you can get him on, that'd be that'd be amazing. He is very well-spoken. I will reach out to him, Constantine Kissin. I, I, let me, yeah, K-I-S-S-I-M, I think. Yes. Um, so Constantine with a K, whoops, okay. <laughs> no. Okay, K I S I N. There we are. K I S I N. Yeah, Constant. Yeah, Kissin. Yeah, Kissin. Uh, Russian British satirist and author. Oh, yeah, he, he uh, has worked as a stand up comedian as well. So, yeah. Stand up comedians tend to be very brilliant. Listen to Dave Chappelle oh, yeah. and you hear exactly what he's telling you. <clears throat> it's quite interesting. I can't tell Dave Chappelle jokes. They might get, might get into issues on YouTube. But just Yeah, please. probably. Mm -hmm. All right, so this has been good. I will keep in touch. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Definitely want to have you on a panel discussion in the future just to get more content out, help people on their journey to success. A question I should have asked you, and I really do want to include this. You work with businesses and entrepreneurs and companies and the like, correct? Yeah. If one of our audience members want to get in contact with you, just to work with you and so on, how could sure. they go about that? Uh, okay. Um, I think the best thing to do is I can send you a couple of links you can put in the description, depending what yeah. they're looking for. Would that work? Oh, yeah. That would work perfectly. Okay. That's great. Um, okay. No, that's perfect. I'll make sure you get those those links probably by the end of this this weekend. Okay, then. Thank you for this, um, Dr. Simeon. And I appreciate it. Very kind, man. I appreciate your time and everything. Have a wonderful day.